Robert Stewart. Um, Robert is an investigative researcher. His extensive investigations into BBC Panorama's programme, Saving Serious Children, have been described by eminent, eminent journalist Jonathan Cook as forensic. Um, Robert has been a dogged and, um, and tenacious in his efforts to, to research this particular piece, this particular program, and it's all its irreg you know, irregularities. Um, he's presented now, this will be his fourth presentation for Froomstock Wars events. Um, he's caught the attention also of a, uh, a film and television and radio producer called Victor Lewis Smith who actually undertakes contracts for the BBC. What he saw in Robert's uh, investigations uh, actually moved him to tear up his contract with the BBC when the BBC Panorama office uh, refused to answer questions with regarding to saving, so regard to saving serious children. Um, what's also happening is that there are plans uh, for Victor to um, create a feature documentary around Robert's work. So we look forward to that. But for now, let's listen to some of uh, Robert's findings. So please to welcome Robert Stewart. Okay. Am I in the way? Yeah. Um, uh, 29th of August, 2013. Um, exactly as... Parliament was voting on whether to join US-led military strikes on Syria. The BBC News at 10 broadcast this report um, by uh, reporter Ian Pannell, cameraman Darren Conway, which purported to show the aftermath of uh, an... Inst so this report went out um, as Parliament was voting on whether to join uh, the US in bombing Syria. And um, I'm just going to play it. It's, if you can see it, uh, hopefully you can see it. They arrived like the walking dead. We don't know for sure what was in the bomb, but the injuries and debris suggest something like napalm or thermite. There were no shrapnel injuries and little blood, just appalling burns. Among the medics here was a British doctor visiting for the charity Hand in Hand. I need a pause because it's just absolute chaos and carnage here. Um, we've had a massive influx of what looks like serious burns. It seems like it must be some sort of, and I'm not really sure, maybe napalm, something similar to that. But obviously within the chaos of the situation it's very difficult to know exactly what's going on. This wasn't a chemical weapon but a so-called conventional one banned from being used in civilian areas by many countries. But 15-year-old Ahmed's government hasn't signed that treaty. Dear United Nations, you're really calling peace. You're calling for peace. What kind of peace are you calling for? Don't you see this? Don't you see this? What do you need to see? We are just human beings. We want to live, you know? Isn't it our right to live? In a basic hospital funded by handouts, the emergency beds were full. Patients slumped to the floor, pleading for help, gasping for water. Okay, so um, a month later, BBC Panorama ran a full uh, program called Saving Serious Children, which included more footage from this incident. I thought, I thought this report was a bit odd in several respects, so did other people. I began to write to the BBC, I used its complaints process, I also began to do my own research. So, um, first of all, um, I got an opinion uh, from a, a doctor on, on the burns that we see in the, the programme. She says, I've watched the Panorama BBC documentary, it makes for interesting viewing, but I think the scene of the school children coming in with the burns was an act. Uh, they were able to sit down, be touched by others, even talk. This is not how a severe burn victim would present. Most victims would be screaming the place down in agony, even after treatment, and with all sorts of pain drugs, they still hurt and still scream. Most would have difficulties with their airways almost immediately. This shows them able to speak and breathing very well, no obvious signs of respiratory distress like coughing, shallow breathing, etc. Some are shown with skin hanging off, but the flesh beneath is not that convincing. It actually looks like more skin. Um, so bearing in mind that uh, the doctor's opinion, I just want to play these, this section again. I'll play it without sound. 
and just ask yourself, is this real? Um, so I got in touch with some uh, an investi some investigators within Syria. They got in touch with some. Uh, they conducted some witness interviews. So this is uh, a report of an interview with a witness who lives in um, the town that was allegedly bombed. Uh, the witness says we never had something like that. Talking about um, a napalm bomb or an incendiary bomb, never, never. Nor did we ever hear about it. Interestingly. Um, the same investigators got this um, quote from a Free Syrian Army commander. You know, the, obviously somebody you would expect to make hay with any allegations against the Syrian government, but no. We, the fighters of the Free Syrian Army, the northwest area of the city of Aleppo, we declare we were present in this region in August 2013 and we did not meet any airstrike with the substance of napalm on Urm al Kubra, the town where the, the uh, school was allegedly bombed, or in any other region in the northwest Aleppo countryside. And then there's the time of when, uh, when the attack supposedly happened. Um, there's a six-hour range. Human Rights Watch say midday, going all the way through to a doctor who was supposedly um, accompanying the victims uh, to, onto Turkey, saying 6 p.m. So midday to 6 p.m. In the middle of that is the uh, reporter, Ian Panel, who's, who's very categoric around 5.30 p.m. His colleague, the cameraman, Darren Conway, less clear, between 3 and 5. A six-hour range. Is that, is that plausible? This woman uh, who was in the report, she's um, presented as one, as one of the victims with the, uh, the white Burns cream. They're with her father. On YouTube, you can find footage of her, and it's very unclear, I'm afraid, um, because of the light, but here she is entering the ambulance, and she's walking um, uh, calmly, unaided, into the ambulance. Uh, she climbs up two steps to get, in, to get into the side door of the ambulance. And uh, it's, then it's a 13-kilometre journey from Umm al Kubra to um, Atareb Hospital, where the BBC film the same woman being... After she's, she's now apparently lost the use of her legs, having climbed in, walked to and climbed in the ambulance, and now she needs to be stretched out of the back by five men, apparently screaming in agony. She goes inside the hospital and has the white cream applied and she's back outside on her feet and stamping her feet. So is, is, this, a, is this a plausible sequence of events? And I just want to note, we're going to come back to this ambulance because uh, there's an in interesting point about that as well later. Um, now, this is going to be a challenge. The boy, um, if you can see... If I, can point. I think last time when I asked, I asked the audience what the boy's expression was... Uh, I got the response jovial, which is not really what you would expect from a napalm victim, clearly. And there are so many contradictions and irregularities in the footage, in the footage and between the various accounts of the event. Yeah, I, I've logged them all on my blog. This, this is a small selection. Um, perhaps one of the most striking ones is this. The two doctors in the report, who I'll talk about in a moment, um, you know, one of them says, I was sitting... Uh, before the first victims arrived, I was sitting on the hospital balcony uh, s drinking my fifth cup of sweet sugary tea. The other doctor, we'd just come out of the basement of the hospital because a warplane a war was flying above. I mean, a clear contradiction there. Um, in fact, in the BBC reports, and, and I think there's no other uh, uh, report of the incident which talks about the warplane over the hospital, which was 14 kilometres away. You know, the warplane was flying over the school in the BBC's reports. Um, also of interest is that the fact that the BBC, BBC Worldwide, very diligently blocking all YouTube copies of Saving Serious Children. You can't find it on YouTube. There's one copy on Vimeo, I think, which um, presumably they can't access. But um, Saving Serious Children is blocked immediately. Any footage is blocked immediately. Any other panorama you can find, any other par panorama that's been uploaded you can find, but not this. Um, so the two doctors... Um, so the first doctor is Dr. Rola Halam. She's a British medic of Syrian origin. Here she is as she appears in Saving Serious Children with the, uh, with the mask. 
And, um, you know, interestingly, she manages to find time to give an interview during what she's described elsewhere as a mass casualty event. Um, but she finds time to take a pause to talk to the camera. Um, and here she is on Newsnight two days later, um, or, well, two days after the report uh, was uh, broadcast, um, lamenting the fact, essentially, that uh, the, the vote went the way it did and, and that we wouldn't be bombing Syria. The world has, I feel the world has failed Syria for the last two and a half years and now is the time to act. Perhaps not surprising when you um, see her father's point of view. Here's her father, Dr. Musa al-Kurdi, on Al Jazeera, and um, attending a very high-profile summit, um, Friends of Syria Summit Istanbul, Istanbul 2012, and here he is on Al Jazeera saying how he, um, telling us how he uh, lobbied some of the attendees, some of the high-profile attendees at that event. Either you defend us or you arm the Syrian Free Army to defend us. You have the choice. Um, this is Dr. Halam's charity, UK registered charity Hand in Hand for Syria, uh, very plainly based on the opposition flag, the Syrian opposition flag. Um, they did drop the stars in 2014, but it's pretty much the same. It's pretty clear what the, uh, what the affiliation is there. This is one of the Hand in Hand for Syria, well, Hand in Hand for Syria employee. This is a photograph from this guy's Facebook account. This was taken at the same hospital that um, Saving Serious Children was filmed at. So he's posted sort of heartwarming images like this on his Facebook account, but he is a multitasker, as I've uh, noted before. A man should have a hobby, <laughs> but not that. Um, yeah, so I flagged this up to the Charity Commission, and they said the issues raised do not raise sufficient regulatory concern. Um, I guess they were too busy with Oxfam. Okay, so the other doctor in Saving Serious Children is Dr. Salia Hassan. You, um, so she's had a flourishing career with the BBC since that Panorama edition. Uh, she was, until fairly recently, a presenter on Trust Me, I'm a Doctor, of all things. Um, yeah, the bio uh, tells us she's uh, got a military background. Uh, and a YouTube video tells us that she, like, uh, she supported the, s the Libyan Revolution, which... Uh, I don't know. I don't know how that sits with BBC editorial policy. <laughs> um, I did ask them, and they kind of fudged that one. Uh, yeah, I came out to support the revolution, then I worked in the hospital to look after the wounded fighters in Libya. Um, and then about a year after Saving Serious Children was on, um, Dr. Hassan fronted a, a short program for Newsnight, a short ex um, report on Newsnight about HOSPEX, which is a military... Uh, casualty simulation exercise, which is aimed at preparing uh, British Army Medical Services personnel for deployment. And if you can see it at all, I'll just play this clip, and you might see why I thought it was of interest. And I've come to see what civilian medicine can learn from medical simulation at this level. It's a method called macro simulation, replicating exactly the conditions medics will face in the field. Today starts with a helicopter rescue. In charge of the whole operation is doctor and army brigadier Kevin Beaton. He was my squadron commander in Bosnia and inspired me to study medicine. The principle behind macro simulation is that it's as close to reality as possible. Actors and makeup artists mimic even the most severe of injuries. Here we've got a casualty that we're making up with um, multiple fragmentation wounds, um, mostly to the both lower limbs. Um, so we've got smaller peppering and then we've got quite a substantial degloving to the foot at this side. It's looking quite gruesome already, but it, but it is fake, it's not real. Okay, so hold that thought. So this is the company uh, which provided the makeup effects we saw in that Newsnight report. It's called Trauma FX. This is their website. Um, their website tells us that they are specialists in simulating chemical, biological, radiological and nuclear injuries and conditions, and also that they support various military forces internationally and can easily travel internationally as they're a mobile team and can work in any location, which may be significant. The BBC claimed in the, one of their, in their responses to me that it would be impossible to 
stage uh, a report such as the Panorama one on, on the front line of an, of an ongoing conflict? Well, yeah, perhaps, but uh, that does say any location, and it is quite clear that they support military forces internationally. Okay, it's just a thought. Um, now, this is... Uh, I just wanted to compare some of the HOSPEX exercise injuries, the simulated injuries, with what we see on Panorama. And if you can spot which is which. Um, I know it's not a very clear image. <coughs> just a couple more. Maybe the context is a bit obvious on this one. Okay, so moving on to the journalists who are involved in the report. Um, in an earlier part of the programme, in Saving Serious Children, um, Ian Paddle and Darren Conway uh, travel to the front line. They have, an, they have a, a security escort. Uh, they travel with their own security. And on the front of one of the vehicles is this logo, which is uh, a group called Arar al-Sham. Now, this group, who are they? Uh, oh, Wikipedia, sorry about that. Anyway, the group aims... Yeah. <laughs> it's corroborated elsewhere. They aim to create an Islamic state under Sharia law and in the past have cooperated with the Al-Nusra Front, an affiliate of Al-Qaeda. So that's Arar al-Sham. Uh, this is a leading figure, of their co-founder, perhaps, uh, according to some sources, Abu Khalid al-Suri, uh, real name Mohammed Bahaya. And he was Al-Qaeda leader Ayman al-Zawahiri's main representative in Syria. And the Spanish identified him as one of Osama bin Laden's most trusted couriers. And they also, th the Spanish also think this person delivered surveillance tapes of the World Trade Center and other landmarks, other American landmarks, to Al-Qaeda's leadership in Afghanistan in 1998. He's also linked to the 2004 Madrid bombing by a series of money transfers. So this is... Uh, the founder of the group that the BBC were um, being driven around by. And how even the BBC described Arar al-Sham as a hardline Islamist group in their other reports. That's the phrase they use most frequently. Um, so, what do our, who are Arar al-Sham's associates? Well, this is a Human Rights Watch report about uh, a series of attacks that took place in Latakia, in Syria, on the 4th of August. Now, this is just 19 days before Saving Syria's children started filming in Syria. And this attack, in this attack, 190 civilians were killed, uh, women, children, elderly men, 200, mostly women and children, were kidnapped. And according to Human Rights Watch, the main uh, fundraisers, organizers, planners, and executors of these attacks were Arar al-Sham, Jabhat al-Nusra, the al-Nusra Front, and Islamic State of Iraq and Sham, ISIS. So there's a, on that connection with ISIS, this question arises. So we're going back to the ambulance that we, uh, the woman who was in the black dress with the white cream, this is the ambulance uh, that she drove off in. Now, I, I can't quite believe I stared at this for over four years and, and it took somebody on Twitter to point out that the flag in the back window is the ISIS flag. And it's a little bit clearer as it's leaving Um al Kubra. But here it is, thank you. Here it is um, being filmed by BBC cameraman Darren Conway OBE from what? Three, four feet away, five feet? Close proximity anyway. And these, uh, these guys, these militants, there's three in total who get out of the back, one of them's armed. And here's the um, ambulance leaving the hospital, also uh, in Saving Serious Children, the ISIS flag there. So, um, interestingly, earlier on in the program, we're led to believe that uh, Panel and Conway are in great danger, uh, as would seem sensible to assume when they're going through an ISIS checkpoint. You can't quite see what it says there, but uh, you know, he's saying it's very dangerous. Journalists have uh, been targeted and killed. We're coming to a checkpoint, put the camera down a bit. It's all very tense, very sort of, um, you know, tense music. This is an ISIS group, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, a group that's affiliated with Al-Qaeda. You can see they're very close to these, uh, the, this ISIS guy. 
and they're filming from their car. I mean, it seems incomprehensible now that any... This was kind of before um, the sort of orange jumpsuits, executions, all that kind of stuff was, was to the fore. So at the time this was put out, it, it might have seemed plausible that Western journalists could get through an ISIS checkpoint. In retrospect, it seems highly unlikely. But one reason may be that Arar al-Sham, who Panel and Conway were ensconced with, worked with the Islamic State until January 2014, and these, this was August 2013. So this was several months before they um, you know, broke up. Um, so there was a partnership there. So this raises some questions. Did any of the Arar al-Sham militants chauffeuring Panel and Conway participate in the mass killing and kidnap of civilians in Latakia just three weeks earlier? Did, was BBC licence fee revenue paid to the hardline Islamist, in the BBC's own words, Arar al-Sham? And also, were Ian Panel and Darren Conway either directly or through their Arar al-Sham security detail working in coordination with ISIS? It, well, I'll just leave that as a question. Um, I sent some of these points to the uh, National Counterterrorism Security Office, and I haven't had a reply. That was in November. As somebody on the, this panel pointed out to me, probably or what I actually did was report myself to the National Counterterrorism <laughs> Security Office. <coughs> but, you know, <coughs> if they're here. Uh, so that's, that's still waiting. Okay, just as a postscript, um, uh, Vanessa, of course, will be telling us more about the White Helmets, but it, this is something else which only um, came to light very recently. Um, yeah, the White Helmets, um, described by John Pilger, as a complete propaganda construct, this um, alleged NGO, search and rescue, first responders funded by uh, the West and Gulf states. Um, so yeah, this guy who appeared as uh, Dr. Roller's right-hand man in Saving Serious Children, just kind of you know, an enigma wrapped in a high visibility vest, is a senior white helmet, we find out from uh, the Atareb White Helmet's Facebook page. Milling around in the hospital courtyard, filmed by the BBC, Another senior white helmet. And next to him, the deputy head of the white helmets, Munir Mustafa, who's uh, rubbing shoulders with Bernie Sanders uh, in uh, just last year. So it doesn't seem like this is a random collection of you know, locals, you know, rel worried relatives, hospital workers. You know, there's some... Uh, a central count, yeah. It's, quite, it's uh, some uh, high-profile opposition people here. Um, and so Munir Mustafa, what do we know about him? Um, well, uh, he actually visited Birmingham last year to, to uh, talk at um, an emergency services uh, uh, event. But here he is in 2013, just after Saving Serious Children. Um, not too clear. And that's the other chap he was standing next to in the courtyard. Here is a, a gunman, you can't quite see him, a chap uh, armed. This person is of particular interest, Amar al Um I, I recognise him immediately because he's, uh, well, he's a former Reuters photographer. You, you may have seen his photos from Syria in the Mail and the Telegraph over the years. I don't, I don't think he's doing that uh, work now. But he photographed some of the victims from Saving Syria's Children, and, and those appeared in the Daily Mail and the New York Post, various places. Um, so what does Amar al Fadj like to get up to in his spare time? He likes to... Uh, Sort of be a, uh, a Hell Cannon fanboy, you know, who knows? Uh, so, this is, um, this is a very awful munition that's uh, used by the opposition. Um, but uh, he's a big fan. Okay, so thank you. That's, um, that's me. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>